So thanks all for coming. It's wonderful to see such a big audience. So today I'm going to describe a number of different projects we do in the uh, unit I run, which we call preclinical critical care unit. But before I actually start, I think it's very important that I acknowledge all the people that have been involved in these studies. Uh, we've got a team at the moment who are actually working away in the lab right now. And as you can see, we've got a couple of Japanese visitors who are, who are here with us. And over the years, you can see we've had numerous visitors from all over the world who've come here to the Flory to work with us because what we do is, is unique and there aren't other places in the world that do what we do. We also work with Professor Bolomo at the Austin, uh, other people at different hospitals, universities, and also uh, collaborate with a number of overseas people. And obviously, I'd like to thank those people, who, the agencies who funded our research. So this gives you a sort of broad overview of the research we do. And the first thing you'll notice is there are, there are a lot of sheep in this. Well, we do most of our research on sheep, which is quite unusual in this day and age. But it has an enormous advantage because if you're studying the cardiovascular system or the kidneys, or the part of the brain where we're interested in. In sheep, they're very similar to humans. If you try and do work on a rat heart or a kidney heart, you can imagine that they're completely different in size, in structure, and uh, in heart rate, for example. So we have a large experimental laboratory in which we have the sheep in these cages. Uh, we do a lot of surgical instrumentation. So this animal is instrumented with many devices on the kidney and the heart so we can monitor what's going on within the kidney. We use fluoroscopy, which is a, a x-ray technique where we can push catheters up through blood vessels into the kidney or into the brain or into the heart. We use the uh, MRI. The Flory has two MRIs out at the Austin. This is a sheep actually just disappearing into the MRI. We have a couple of large animal operating theatres, and here we're doing some neurosurgery. Our model of heart failure, we monitor by using echocardiography, as they do in patients. And here's a sheep having echocardiography to look at its cardiac function. Uh, we put electrodes into different nerves, and using this equipment, we can record the activity in the nerves. And we've recently set up cardiopulmonary bypass. And in fact, uh, there's an experiment going on this morning uh, doing cardiopulmonary bypass on a sheep. And I'll explain why we're interested in that. So you can see we have a wide range of techniques and a wide range of uh, questions that we're asking. So our aim is to take the dis our discoveries and translate them from the preclinical studies that we do to treatments for critically ill patients. And this is why we have a lot of collaborations with intensive care units, both at the Austin Hospital and at the Royal Melbourne Hospital. So these are the main projects we're working on at the moment. And today I'm going to go through the, these first three in a, a little bit of detail with you. So the first project I'm going to talk about is heart failure, and we're studying the brain as a possible therapeutic target. We've got a big study on septic shock, and we're looking at new therapies and developing a new biomarker for kidney injury, which is a big problem in patients with sepsis. And then finally, I'll discuss some work we've been doing on development of an intravascular electrode as a new kind of brain-machine interface to help paralyze patients. As I mentioned, we also do a number of other studies. Uh, the one on cardiopulmonary bypass is to understand why patients who have cardiopulmonary bypass get kidney injury, and we're working out ways of preventing that happening. For many years, we've been working on treatments for heart attacks, and we actually have a drug that's being tested in a phase two trial in Melbourne in patients who've had heart attacks. And this drug significantly reduces damage to the heart after a heart attack. <coughs> and then we've got another very exciting study where we're trying to save the brain because many people have heart attacks. The, the survival rate is very low. 
and few of those that do survive often have neurological deficits and we're trying to work out a way to prevent that, that happening. So first of all I'm going to describe our studies on, on heart failure. <clears throat> and the brain is a novel, novel target for, for heart failure. So what is heart failure? When the heart, when the heart is damaged, for example, after a heart attack, this causes damage to some of the muscle in the heart. The heart is then not able to contract properly. And so the output of blood from the heart is reduced. And this leads to decreased perfusion of blood through all the organs in the body. For patients with heart failure, this results in chronic tiredness, reduced capacity for physical activity, shortness of breath, and eventually death. This is a, a big, big problem, and the latest report estimates over 61,000 adult Australians have heart, are diagnosed with heart failure each year. 480,000 Australians are currently affected. It's estimated over the next 20 years, this number will increase to three quarters of a million. It's one of the most expensive diseases to treat in that many of these people require regular hospital care. And the annual cost at the moment is 2.7 billion. The problem is that current treatments really only slow the progression of heart failure. And although we've got better treatments now, we still need, need to improve this. So why are we interested in looking at the brain to control, improve the, uh, the, the uh, output of the heart in heart failure? Well, the brain plays a major role in controlling the heart through two major neural mechanisms. And these are controlled by areas in the brain stem, the hindbrain, which is a very evolutionary ancient area of the brain and is very similar in all mammals. The vagus nerve, which goes to the heart, is actually involved in slowing the heart rate and slowing the contractility of the heart. Whereas in contrast, what we call the sympathetic nerves, which innervate the heart, they increase heart rate and they increase the force of contraction of the heart. So that results in an increase in output of the heart. So when you do exercise, you get a big increase in activity of these sympathetic nerves that cause increased blood to be pumped from the heart so that the muscles can get more oxygen and nutrients. So we can think of the sympathetic nerves as an accelerator. They increase the rate and they increase the amount of blood and in contrast, the vagus nerve acts as a brake, and the two act together to control the rate of your heartbeat and the output of blood from your heart. So our studies have focused really entirely on the sympathetic nerves, and what we've done is we've developed techniques for putting microelectrodes into these nerves, so we can record the activity coming down from the brain to these nerves that go to the heart. <clears throat> so, as I said, in heart failure, the heart is unable to pump blood to all the organs at a normal level. So, what then happens is that all the organs in the body signal to the brain that they require more blood. So, there are uh, receptors that detect pressure, some detect oxygen, and there are sensory systems in all these organs, and all these send messages to the brain to say, <clears throat> please increase the output of the heart. So what happens is then the activity of this nerve steadily increases, but of course, because the heart is damaged, it can't actually increase its output. So what happens is you get a prolonged increase in this activity of this nerve, and the neurotransmitter that's released at the levels of the heart actually ends up causing damage to the heart. It also can cause the heart to beat irregularly and induce what's called ventricular fibrillation when the heart is not beating in a coordinated fa fashion and that results in sudden death, which is 
one of the main causes of death in patients with heart failure. So over the years, what we've done is we've looked at all these different inputs and we've tried inhibiting them with the hope that that would reduce this big level of nerve activity. But unfortunately, what we found is each one of these we blocked just had a small influence. So it just dropped the nerve activity level a little bit, which wasn't very helpful as a treatment for patients. So what we decided to do <clears throat> was to look in the brain and see if we could find a final common pathway that we could block there that would block this high level of nerve activity. So what we did is we've developed <clears throat> a new kind of microelectrode that we can put into these nerves which go to the heart and record the nerve activity. And in order to induce heart failure, we put a pacing lead into the heart, which is like a normal pacing lead people uh, have put in clinically. And we actually pace the heart at three times its normal rate. So the normal heart rate of a sheep is about 70, which is the same as yours. And if you force the heart to beat rapidly over a period of two months, this in, is the way of inducing heart failure. So that's how we induce the heart failure. The sheep <coughs> doesn't actually notice when you start doing this. So you can have a sheep standing there, its heart rate 70. You switch on the pacemaker, it goes up to 200, <coughs> and the animal just stands there as if nothing's happened. We can then <coughs> infuse drugs intravenously, and we can also put probes into different parts of the brain and infuse drugs into the brain to work out which parts of the brain are, are involved. Or we can actually put electrodes into a different nucleus in the brain and lesion that part of the brain so we can destroy tiny little areas of the brain. So <clears throat> this shows you the results from a normal healthy animal. The top trace is blood pressure, and every time the heart beats, as you know, the blood pressure increases, and that's the pulse you can feel when you feel your own pulse. So each time the heart beats, there's an increase in pressure. This shows you the what we call the cardiac sympathetic nerve activity. So it's the sympathetic nerves which go to the heart. And <clears throat> what you can notice is there are these big bursts, and each of these is a burst of activity passing down the nerve from the brain to the heart. And you can see that these are in discrete bursts, and each of these bursts is in time with, with a heartbeat. When we do the same recording in a sheep with heart failure, I think you can see very strikingly there is a massive increase in the number of bursts. So this is pretty much a burst with every beat, you can see the bursts are bigger. So you've got this massive increase in this nerve activity coming from the brain to the heart. And as I said, the aim of that is to try to increase the cardiac output, the output of blood from the heart, but because the heart's damaged, that doesn't happen. So <clears throat> once this starts, this increase in activity goes on for months and months and weeks and years and, and doesn't stop. And one of the major drugs that is given to patients with heart failure is to try to block the effect of this, this, uh, this nerve activity. So this shows you the... Not sure it's in real time. I don't know if you can hear this very well. So what you can see is there's a burst of activity with each heartbeat. So that's actually what it looks like when you're recording it from a conscious sheep standing in its cage. As I mentioned, we have been trying to find out where in the brain this activity comes from and find out if we can block a small area in the brain that will prevent this high level of activity. So this is a cross-section through a sheep's brain. And <clears throat> I mentioned that this area of the brainstem here is where much of the, uh, many of the pathways are that control the nerves which go to the heart. 
And we've been looking at a little small nucleus here called the area postrema, which is a special nucleus in that it doesn't have a blood-brain barrier. Now, most of the brain has a barrier so that blood going through the brain does not, there's uh, a lot of the compounds are restricted. They can't go through those blood vessels into the brain tissue. This area is unusual in that it doesn't have that blood-brain barrier. So it's thought of as a window between the circulation and the brain. So any circulating hormones or circulating factors that are in the blood can be detected by this area. And they can, this area can then signal other parts of the brain to give an indication of what's going on within the, in the uh, periphery and within the blood. So <clears throat> we've looked at the effect of actually destroying this little area of brain and to see what that does to the nerve activity to the heart. So as I said, in a healthy animal, there's quite a low level of nerve activity, and I've shown these sort of red dots here as a sort of scheme to give an idea of the release of noradrenaline, which is the neurotransmitter which acts on the heart to increase the heart rate and the force of contraction. What happens in heart failure is you get this massive increase in release of, of noradrenaline. What's very well established is this large sustained increase in nerve activity of the heart is detrimental. And then we looked at the effect of lesioning the area postrema, and when we did that, we found that the cardiac sympathetic nerve activity returned to normal. And this shows you the recordings we made. So as I showed you before in the control animal, you get very few of these bursts of nerve activity to the heart. In heart failure, you get a massive increase. And when we lesion this tiny little area of the brain, the nerve activity returned pretty much to normal. So that's very nice, but the question is, does this really have any real benefit? So does this reduction in sympathetic nerve activity to the heart in heart failure have any benefit? So we then did some studies in rats. And in these rats, we induced heart failure by myocardial infarction. So that's tying off one of the blood vessels in the heart, which mimics what happens when you have a heart attack. We then lesioned the area postrema, and what we found in these animals that that reduced the decline in cardiac function that normally occurs in heart failure. It decreased cardiac fibrosis, which uh, is uh, something which causes decreased contractility of the heart, and it improved cardiac structure. So reducing this nerve activity really seems to have an enormous benefit on the function and the structure of the heart. So, <clears throat> just to conclude on this little section, the area postrema plays a major role in determining the increase in cardiac sympathetic nerve activity in the heart failure. And it's well known that this increase causes a progressive decrease in cardiac function. So what we're now doing is to try to determine what are the stimuli that act on this brain nucleus, the area postrema, to result in this increased cardiac nerve activity in heart failure. And as I mentioned, this little area doesn't have a blood-brain barrier, so we think it's probably some circulating hormones or some inflammatory factors that are in the blood that are acting on this nucleus in the brain. And if we can determine what that is, we can probably work out a way to inhibit it. So we could actually then develop a drug that can be given to patients. So our aim is to develop a treatment that inhibits specific neurons that act to increase cardiac sympathetic nerve activity in heart failure. And we believe such a treatment would reduce the decline in cardiac function in patients with heart failure that normally occurs and is, norm and is such a problem that we don't at the moment have a good treatment for. So I'll now move <clears throat> on to a completely different topic, We're moving away from the heart and the brain 
to the kidneys. And uh, this is a project we've been working on with, with intensive care physicians now for about 10 years. So first of all, I'll describe to you what, what is septic shock. Septic shock is something that's obviously also uh, called blood poisoning commonly. And septic shock, it's a life-threatening condition of organ dysfunction due to a systemic infection. So it's when an infection gets into your bloodstream, which might be from secondary to pneumonia, or a urinary tract infection, or it could be following uh, surgery. Septic shock is currently the leading cause of acute kidney injury. And the incidence of septic shock is about 15,000 patients a year in Australia. And the mortality rate is about 30%. So it's a nasty thing. In patients having septic shock together with acute kidney injury, the mortality is up to 60%. Presently, there's no specific therapy. The only treatment of the septic is treatment of the septic focus and supportive care. And we're particularly interested in the acute kidney injury that occurs in sepsis. And as I said, this is because if you have acute kidney injury together with septic shock, it's a big increase in mortality compared to just having sepsis alone. So at the moment, a major problem in developing therapies for acute kidney injury arises from our limited understanding of the pathogenesis, the causes of this kidney injury, and also we don't have a good biomarker that allows us to detect the risk of acute kidney injury. So we have a number of projects working at the moment to try to understand this. The first is investigation of the causes of septic acute kidney injury. The second is development of a treatment for this kidney injury. And the third thing, which I'm going to discuss probably in most detail today, is development of a real-time biomarker. Because if you can't detect it and you don't have a biomarker for it, it's very difficult to work out new treatments. So, over the last 10 years, we've been looking at the possible causes of acute kidney injury, and all the clinical textbooks say that it's because of reduced blood flow to the kidney. We've shown this is absolutely not true, and we've completely overturned this dogma now. The other cause that's been proposed is that cells within the kidney die, either due to the inflammation or <clears throat> some other cause. We've shown that this doesn't occur, and there's now data from patients to show that there isn't cell death in the kidney. And we've also demonstrated that there isn't failure of the mechanisms within the kidney that are generating energy. So our focus has moved to microcirculatory failure within the kidney. So this means that the small blood vessels are not distributing blood in the right way to the right parts of the kidney. And what this can do is this can lead to localized hypoxia. Hypoxia, by hypoxia I mean a decrease in oxygen levels in the tissue in the kidney. And obviously if you don't have oxygen, the right concentration, then that's going to damage the function of the kidney. So what we've done is we've developed a a new technique that nobody else has had before to put probes within the kidney to measure the oxygen levels and the perfusion of blood within localized areas within the kidney. So the kidney is made up of two main areas. The outer area is called the cortex and the inner area is the medulla. And these two areas have different function and the blood uh, Perfusion of blood is controlled by different mechanisms. So we put these probes into the kidney and at the tip you measure the oxygen level and the perfusion level. We also put a, what we call the flow probe on the renal artery which is the main blood vessel supplying the kidney and this measures total renal blood flow to the whole kidney. 
and then we put a catheter into the vein, which is where the blood comes from the kidney, and we can sample that blood and measure the oxygen level in the blood. So we can calculate the total amount of oxygen used by the kidney. And as well as that, we also have been putting an oxygen probe into a bladder catheter. So here's in gray shows you the bladder catheter with a balloon, which they have inside the bladder. And we put this oxygen probe up to the tip of the bladder catheter. And here you can see the ureters, which are the two tubes that come down from the kidneys. The urine comes down into the, the kidney. And all patients in intensive care units have a bladder catheter. So it's relatively non-invasive just to put this probe up into the bladder catheter. And we're actually having discussions with a couple of companies at the moment who are interested in developing a bladder catheter that has this probe embedded in it. And I'll explain to you why we're interested in measuring the oxygen levels in the urine. So this shows you what happens when we induce <coughs> septic shock in the sheep. And we do that by infusing a bacteria called E. coli intravenously into the blood of the sheep. So that is a way of inducing septic shock in the sheep. This shows you the blood pressure. You can see that it's constant during a control period. When we make the animals septic, you get a big fall in blood pressure, which is what happens in patients. And this fall in blood pressure means that many of the organs in the body don't get properly perfused with blood. And this leads to multi-organ failure and, in many cases, death. As I mentioned, the blood flow to the kidney doesn't go down. And in fact, we've shown that it goes up during septic shock. So as I said, we put these probes into the kidney. And there are two layers of the kidney. So first of all, if we look at the outer layer, the cortex, and this shows you the level of perfusion through the small blood vessels in the kidney. And you can see that during the development of septic shock, there really is little effect on the perfusion in the cortex and little effect on the oxygen level in the cortex. But when we look at the medulla, which is the inner layer of the kidney, you can see a different picture. You can see that when we induce sepsis with E. coli, there is a drop in the level of perfusion and also a big drop in the level of oxygen in the kidney. Now, as I said before, if you get a big drop in the level of oxygen in, in an organ, that's going to cause damage and prevent its normal function. So here you can see we get a really big drop. So oxygen levels drop from about 30 millimeters of mercury to near a 10. So it's dropping by two thirds. So this shows you, <clears throat> again, the drop in oxygen level in that inner zone of the kidney called, called the medulla during the first 24 hours of infusion of this bacteria, E. coli. And so over this time, septic shock develops and this level of oxygen drops in the kidney. So I mentioned that we also measure the oxygen level in the bladder, in the urine and the bladder. And what is very exciting is that this level drops in parallel with the level in the medulla. So obviously in patients, you can't <laughs> go around sticking probes into their kidney, but you can put a probe very simply into a bladder catheter. So this provides clinicians with a wonderful opportunity simply by measuring the oxygen level in the urine to get an indication of what's happening to the oxygen level within the kidney. And if we compare that with the best biomarker that's available at the moment is called a biomarker called urinary NGAL. So you have to collect the urine, the sample has to be sent off to be measured. You can see that after four hours, the level of this hasn't changed. And it's only after eight hours that the level of this biomarker increases. So it's not until somebody has been septic for eight to 24 hours using this biomarker that a clinician can actually tell that the patient is developing kidney injury. Whereas using this novel biomarker we've developed, within one hour of septic shock beginning, 
you can actually detect that there is a risk of kidney injury. Does this also work in patients? Well, there's a trial going on at the moment at the Austin Hospital <coughs> where they're using these oxygen probes and putting them into bladder catheters of patients who've got septic shock. And one of the main treatments for patients with septic shock is to give them a, a infusion of noradrenaline. This is a drug which increases blood pressure to try and increase perfusion of the organs. And what we have shown in the sheet is that soon as you start this noradrenaline infusion, the oxygen level in the kidney drops and there's an equivalent drop in the oxygen level in the urine. Obviously in the patients, you can't measure the oxygen level in the kidney. This shows in three patients measurements of the oxygen level in the urine during a similar infusion of noradrenaline that we give in, our sh in the sheep. And you can see that in every case, we get a drop in oxygen level in the, in the bladder urine that's very similar to what we see in sheep. So we think that this discovery of a new biomarker is going to translate very quickly from our studies in sheep to be used in patients in ICU. So we think urinary oxygenation will be a non-invasive real-time biomarker to aid in the early diagnosis of risk of acute kidney injury. So what happens at the moment is if somebody gets an insult that's going to lead to <coughs> development of sepsis, first of all, you have a risk of acute kidney injury. You then develop some dysfunction of the tubules. You get, uh, then that leads to acute kidney injury and eventually kidney failure, which means that you really have to go onto renal replacement therapy. The best biomarkers we have detect this renal tubular dysfunction. Probably the most commonly used biomarker doesn't detect injury until it, it has already occurred. And what we believe is that the kidney injury is caused by this reduced oxygen level in this inner layer of the kidney, the medulla. So what we need is something that detects that very early and we think measurement of urinary oxygenation is going to be a test to do this. So urinary oxygenation detects this within one hour. Current biomarkers, the best ones take eight hours, but the most commonly used biomarker that's used takes up to 24 hours to actually detect kidney injury. What I've shown you is that urinary oxygenation is a new biomarker for the risk of acute kidney injury. It's currently being tested at as a real-time biomarker of acute kidney injury in patients at the ICU at the Austin. And in fact, I just had a visitor over from the Royal Melbourne this morning and uh, we're just setting up a trial there as well. A non-invasive measurement of urinary oxygenation will enable early detection of the risk of kidney injury. And what's really important, I think, about this is that it will allow treatment to start much earlier, thus enabling clinicians to modify their treatments to reduce the development of septic acute kidney injury. So the final and third part is again going back to the brain. This <clears throat> is development of an intravascular electrode to help paralyze patients. And uh, we recently published this in a very prestigious journal called Nature Biotechnology, but it also received a, a lot of press. This new device that uh, is a new type of brain machine interface that we hope might be able to help paralyze patients. So what I'm going to talk about is what is wrong with the current technology, why our device that we call the stentrode is better, and what we think the future is for the stentrode. So currently, if you want to record activity from the motor cortex in the brain, which is the, the part of the brain that controls your movement, so if you want to move your arm, this area in the brain becomes active and determines your movement. Even if you think about moving your arm but don't move it, that area still becomes active. And the aim of studies to create a brain-machine interface is that you put electrodes into that particular area of the brain and record the activity. 
This shows the current electrode device that's used. It's called the Utah array. You can see it's made up of something like 100 little needle electrodes. This gives you an idea of the size of it. This is then put into the brain tissue itself. So you have to do a craniotomy, so you have to cut away part of the skull. You have to then cut through the dura, which is a lining over the top of the brain. This device is then pushed into the brain tissue itself. And obviously, that has a number of disadvantages. The disadvantages are that you have to do a craniotomy, which has a risk of infection and bleeding. The biggest disadvantage is that the signal decreases over about six months. The brain sees all these little needles as foreign tissue. So you get like scar tissue forming around those needles. And then as that happens, slowly the signal disappears. This device, however, does have a big advantage in that you get a very high quality signal. And using this signal, you can look up videos on the YouTube there are people, you can see this lady here, she has a big plug going into the top of her head, connected to one of these devices. And this plug then is connected to a bionic arm. And simply by thinking, she can make that bionic arm move, pick up a drink, and she can have a drink. So what we have been <coughs> doing is developing a device we call the stent probe. So this is a stent such as you put in the heart to open up a coronary vessel. Put microelectrodes, you can see the microelectrodes on the stent. And then the aim will be to put the stentrode up through this main vein, coming up through the, the, the brain, and then along one of these side vessels. And this red area here is the, the motor cortex, the area of your brain which controls your movement. So if we can deposit the stentrode along here, then perhaps we can record activity of the neurons that surround that blood vessel. So obviously you can't practice doing this in humans and developing in humans. So what we've been doing is doing this in the sheep, and this is the sheep brain. And in the sheep, the motor cortex is in a slightly different position, it just runs either side of the central sagittal sinus here. <clears throat> and what's lucky is this blood vessel here in the sheep is a very similar size to this one in the human. So this turned out to be an ideal animal model in which to test, develop, and validate this new device. So what we've been doing in the sheep is we put this device up through this blood vessel and put it here and see then if we can actually record activity. That gives you an idea of the size of this. It's about 20 millimeters long. So what we've done is we've put this device into sheep brains <clears throat> and we've developed how we can do this. We can insert the stentrode into a blood vessel in the brain and we do this very simply by just inserting it into the jugular vein, which is the main vein which comes down from your head here, which is a very large vein, and you can easily just, through the skin, insert the catheter and then push this device up through here. <clears throat> Using a fluoroscope, you can actually watch it go up through the blood vessels, and you then just maneuver it up through this pathway, which is actually quite a tortuous pathway. But we've developed all the techniques to do that now. So we've shown we can implant it up into the brain. We've recorded activity of the neurons and actually shown that we can record activity of these neurons that are around the blood vessel. And we've shown that the signal varies as expected with different maneuvers. We've shown that the signal lasts for at least six months. And as I said, with the current techniques that are available, within six months, most of the signal disappears but we found that our signal does not disappear. And we think that's because this device is within a blood vessel and the brain therefore doesn't see it. And therefore it's not getting shielded by fi fibrous tissue that forms. And the other worry we had was that if we put this device in a blood vessel, maybe you'll get clots forming around it and eventually the blood vessel will block up, which would not be a good thing. And what we showed that in fact that doesn't happen 
that the implantation is safe and the blood vessel didn't block. So the future for this device is next year we hope to have a clinical trial in three quadriplegic patients. Uh, the guys that are running this have been doing a lot of work interacting with companies to get commercial versions of it made up to the sort of quality that's required to implant into patients. Eventually, the aim will be to develop wireless technology to transmit signals because at the moment, this device is connected to wires which then come down through the blood vessel and will eventually go to a device in the chest which will transmit signals. Obviously, the aim will be to eventually develop a micro wireless device that will be in the blood vessel so there won't be wires coming out. We're also interested in possible use in other diseases such as motor neuron disease where in the later phases of that patients lose the ability to move and communicate with their, their family and friends. And also we think that this device as well as being used for recording we could use it for stimulating and this might be useful for diseases such as Parkinson's disease. So just to summarize I've discussed our work on the brain as a therapeutic target in heart failure, and I showed you that this little nucleus called the areoposterema is a major site driving this detrimental increase in cardiac sympathetic nerve activity, this nerve to the heart in heart failure. If we lesion this area, it reduces the decline in cardiac function in heart failure. We've developed a new real-time biomarker for septic acute kidney failure. And in sepsis, I've shown that tissue perfusion and oxygen levels decrease selectively in this inner part of the kidney called the renal medulla. <coughs> changes in urinary oxygenation parallel the changes in this medullary site. And urinary oxygenation, we believe, is a novel real-time biomarker of risk of acute kidney injury. And finally, the stentrode, we think this is a novel brain-machine interface. So development of this intravascular electrode, we believe, will help paralyzed patients. So thank you very much. <laughs>